Good evening and thanks for joining us. You've tuned in to Arirang's Within the Frame. I'm Handan in Seoul. Defense chiefs of South Korea, the United States and Japan have recently gathered in Tokyo, further strengthening their collective defense posture. For the first time, the three nations signed a memorandum to institutionalize their trilateral security cooperation, which came before America votes to choose their next leader. Meanwhile, the ASEAN Regional Forum wrapped up in Laotian capital Vientiane, where the three nations face delegates from North Korea, Russia and China amid escalating regional tensions. South Korea's Defense Minister Shin Won-sik meanwhile suggested that North Korea might conduct its seventh nuclear test around the time of the upcoming U.S. presidential election. Security dialogues amid heightened tensions, that's the topic of our discussion today. And for expert insights, we're now joined by Park won Gun, Professor of North Korea Studies at Ihua Women's University. It's been a while since we talked. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Also with us tonight is Dr. John Nelson Wright, head of Japan and Korea's program at University of Cambridge. Always a pleasure to have you with us. Great to be back. All right, Professor Park, I want to start with you. Defense Minister Shin Won-sik met with his U.S. and Japanese counterparts, concluding talks with a trilateral security cooperation framework. Now, there's a great deal of attention focused on the fact that they have institutionalized their security partnership. First, give us details of the agreement and their significance. I think uh, most of you still remember that the last year, August, the South Korea, Japan, and United States uh, gathered at the Camp David and they uh, fulfilled the agreement among three countries. And this time, you just mentioned the trilateral secret cooperation framework and also defense minister three countries meeting are the two very important kind of uh, implementations of this agreement at the Camp David. And especially the so-called TSCF is the first document jointly signed by three countries to, as you mentioned, that institutionalized the security cooperation. And it includes a high level of policy consultation and also information sharing and the trilateral drills. Of course, South Korea, Japan, and United States, we already conducted uh, many uh, the, the joint military exercise. And lately, we have a so-called freedom edge among three countries. And also, this document and very clear mentioning the goal of the three countries to bring in peace and the stability on the Korean Peninsula. And at the same time, these three countries get the more likely actively engaged in the Pacific matters too. And also another thing I just mentioned that the trilateral meeting among this defense minister and they are trying to regularize this meeting. And so they promised to have another meeting in 2025, next year in Seoul. And we may be able to talk about this one. This is simply you know, kind of preparing the possible return of the former president of Donald Trump. And then that's why these three countries are trying to institutionalize this uh, three countries cooperation. And from the South Korean perspective, this is a very important meeting because it enhanced the deterrence capability against North Korea's nuclear and missile threats. And at the same time, South Korea is a little bit challenged because, of course, the United States' main goal is, of course, they are trying to deter the North Korea, but more broadly, they are trying to balance it against China. So it's going to be a kind of a not that easy choice for South Korea. China is also another important consideration. Now, the three nations have been stepping up security cooperation since the launch of the Yun administration, but uh, this marks the first time they formalized their partnership with a memorandum. So I guess it's quite a landmark move. Now, Dr. Nilsson Wright, South Korea's Defense Minister Shin, said the agreement is, quote unquote, irreversible and irrevocable. Uh, but some are questioning if the new security framework would survive possible change of U.S. government. What are your thoughts? Well, I mean, the possibility of a second Trump administration is obviously a key factor in explaining why um, the three countries have been working so assiduously to try and, as uh, Professor Park was pointing out, institutionalize their cooperation. Trump, however, remains an unpredictable figure. Um, and in a second presidency, we've heard him say very definitively that he's going to go after what he calls the deep state. Um, 
there is, I think, a lot of concern that the, if you like, the senior figures of his past administration, the more conventional foreign and security policy actors will be less well represented in a future Trump administration. We still don't know who might be a future Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense. There's been talk, for example, of Robert O'Brien, uh, Trump's final last national security advisor having a key position. Even the possibility of Mike Pompeo coming back, maybe in the role of Secretary of State, that would perhaps have a stabilizing impact on Donald Trump. Um, but it remains the case that this is a, a political figure who has a highly transactional view of alliance relations, um, who feels that both South Korea and Japan should be spending a lot more on defense. Uh, and with that in mind, could he possibly tear up these agreements? I think it's unlikely. Um, What's perhaps the biggest worry is the possibility that, tempted by a deal with North Korea, Donald Trump might be minded to offer something in the way of a build-down of U.S. forces on the Korean Peninsula, for example. And just listening to his convention speech uh, a few weeks ago at the Republican convention, where he talked in very positive terms about Kim Jong-un and their personal relationship, um, it's not it not perhaps unlikely to assume that he might be tempted to do just that. So the key factor going forward will be this institutional cooperation. And I think the scale of the trilateral cooperation is important, building on initiatives like Freedom Edge. Um, the question mark, I think, looking forward is how do the two junior partners in this trilateral relationship deliver on their military cooperation? One key factor is the cost. Uh, a country like Japan, for example, now with historically low levels of its currency, the yen at about 153, is making it very difficult for Japan to follow through on some of its more ambitious defense expenditure claims. Um, so if Trump were to win in November, I think we will see more pressure um, on both South Korea and Japan to do more. It's already clear that countries like Japan, for example, are providing material assistance to the United States. For example, the decision to provide um, PAC-3 um, anti-missile uh, defenses that will be part of um, support for the United States and to give it in turn support to help it um, back Ukraine in the war against Russia, P potential agreements to build medium range missiles in Japan. All of these things are efforts to demonstrate to the United States, both the current and potential future administrations, the countries like Japan and South Korea are not only providing for the security of um, Northeast Asia, and the Indo-Pacific, but also helping the United States materially in, in its broader global security concerns. The last factor to consider, of course, is that politics changes on a rapidly um, developing basis in the last two weeks, and the emergence of Kamala Harris as the um, heir apparent to the Biden administration um, has clearly changed the political dynamics. It's less certain, with the polls tightening, that Trump's victory is assured in November, and so we should keep that in mind in looking ahead uh, to the autumn and the possibility that there may in fact be a lot of continuity between the current administration and the next one if um, Kamala Harris is successful as becoming president. Defense Minister Shin says that strong trilateral security ties benefit all three countries. Uh, and so the pact will remain intact regardless of changes in leadership. And you also view that tearing up all the institutionalized agreements is would be unlikely even for Trump, who views U.S. allies as freeloaders. Now, Professor Park. North Korea has long been sensitive to South Korea-U.S.-Japan joint security efforts, slamming that the three countries' combined military drills have developed into an Asian version of NATO. Uh, what sort of response would the formalization of the security framework draw from North Korea? First of all, <clears throat> we all know that it is impossible to build uh, the Asian version of NATO here in the Indo-Pacific area because uh, mainly the uh, alliance system here is like uh, the bilateral relationship and bilateral alliance. Of course, the United States are lately trying to build more like the lattice-like 
uh, alliance structure here, but it is impossible to have like a collective security as the uh, NATO has been doing for past several decades. And about the North Korea, they are, of course, they are very severely criticized the trilateral cooperation, especially Kim Jong-un himself has made several statements in his plenary meeting and even the People's Supreme Assembly speech, and he's uh, kind of emotionally criticized the trilateral cooperation. In other this is, I think, a very clear kind of evidence that it, the deterrence works. I mean, South Korea, Japan, and United States are three very uh, advanced military in every sense. And then those three countries are trying to implement and very important the military operations, such as to detect and hit the North Korean missiles. And at the same time, these three countries are the having uh, military exercise to have a so-called anti-submarine operation. This is uh, definitely enhance our capability against North Korean threats. And do you ask the, the question about the North Korea's possible responses? And of course, they are trying to do something, but overall, I think it's pretty much limited. First, North Korea will try to enhance cooperation with Russia and of course, China. And they are trying to build uh, some kind of block among with uh, the three countries. And even Kim Jong Un himself mentioned that uh, this is the era of a new Cold War. But problem is that China does not want to have any kind of this new Cold War. And officially, China has mentioned that they are very strongly uh, denied and the uh, op oppose any kind of a new Cold War scheme. And second one is North Korea is going to is trying to have a, some kind of high intensity localized provocation, but I think it's pretty much pretty much limited. Uh, last year and November, Kim Jong Un already mentioned that they are going to you know totally deny the Northern Limit Line here in the Korean Peninsula, but still they haven't have any kind of a uh, the actual behavior or provocation in the NLL, and it's because South Korea and the United States so we are very well prepared for any kind of possible provocation attack by North Korea, and finally. North Korea, so of course, they are trying to develop their missiles. They have ICBMs, long and the middle and short range, and all kind, almost 20 something different kind of missiles. And they are trying to uh, keep trying to develop those missiles. Defense Minister Shin won also held one on one talks with Japanese Defense Minister Kihara Minoru on the sidelines during his trip, uh, which marked the first visit to Japan by a South Korean defense chief in 15 years. Dr. Nilsson Wright, how do you see the outcome of the bilateral talks and what are your prospects for the two countries' security relations going forward? I think this is um, a very significant breakthrough in bilateral ties. Uh, it should not be underestimated, the symbolism of uh, the defense minister traveling to Tokyo, particularly on the on the sidelines of this important U.S.-Japan uh, meeting to talk about joint operational cooperation between U.S. and Japanese forces. Um, the, the timing is therefore not coincidental. I think it is important. It reflects long-term continuities, of course, from the very beginning of the Biden administration. Uh, we saw Washington's efforts to bring Seoul and Tokyo closer together. Um, that's continuing, of course, with the visit to the region now of um, Secretary of State Blinken uh, and Austin, the Secretary of State of Defense. Um, this also, I think, is a reminder uh, of how much common interest Japan and South Korea have in addressing that very real and present danger from North Korea. And it's worth, I think, highlighting how much South Korea, under the leadership of President Yoon, has taken the initiative to reach out to Japan consistently. Uh, Professor Park mentioned the very important Freedom Edge uh, joint trilateral uh, operations designed to enhance security in a broad range of areas, bringing the air and naval forces of the two countries closer together, cooperating on cybersecurity, anti-submarine warfare, um, ballistic missile defense. All of these things are really um, materially ways to enhance security cooperation between Seoul and Tokyo. And part of that has been by putting to one side past disagreements, uh, going back to 2018 when there was um, controversy surrounding naval engagements or naval um, interactions between Japanese and South Korean forces. That has been put to one side. That's a very important step forward. But in all of this, we shouldn't forget that however much the two militaries may be working together and the senior political leadership, the wild card in all of this is domestic politics. Um, and just as populist pressures in the United States have encouraged Donald Trump to be a, 
disruptive force. It is possible that with the opposition party in South Korea under the leadership of Lee Jae-myung, um, criticizing President Yoon for, in its words, um, betraying South Korea's national interests by working too closely with Japan, that may be a disruptive force. And that remains to be seen. Um, and therefore, I think it's been important for the UN administration not only to strengthen security cooperation, but to keep the diplomatic relationship between the two countries um, front and center in, uh, in terms of bilateral dialogue. Uh, one, I think, very encouraging development has been the decision to nominate um, Professor Pak Chol Hee, a professor at Seoul National University and head of the, until recently, the, the Diplomatic Academy of South Korea as the new ambassador to, to Tokyo. Professor Park has immense um, knowledge and deep contacts with key decision makers, both in the government of Japan, but also across the political spectrum. And I think that is a necessary step to keep the relationship on an even keel, whether it's sufficient to guard against these populist pressures um, remains to be seen. But so far, I think this is a very positive set of developments. Meanwhile, Professor Park, the ASEAN Regional Forum was held in Vientiane. Some rare moments were captured as it convened foreign ministers and delegates from South Korea, U.S., Japan, as well as North Korea, Russia, and China. Walk us through some of the highlights. Well, this is the only multilateral platform that North Korea regularly engaged with. And this time get more attention because of the Russian's Ukraine war and Russia, of course, participate the ARF and China's maritime disputes with uh, many of the ASEAN countries and also North Korea-Russian cooperation and finally North Korea's provocation. As we expect the South Korea, Japan and United States, we have severely criticized the violation of our UN Secret Council by the North Korea's nuclear and missile development. And of course, we criticized military cooperation between North Korea and Russia. And on the other hand, and the Russia and the North Korea, of course, they, uh, they criticize South Korea, especially they criticize the United States that United States, uh, the military activity and on the peninsula can bring the, such a high tensions. And interestingly enough, the Chinese position is kind of a neutral. Of course, they are some kind of mantra that should bring the, some stability and every party should uh, engage in dialogue, but not to take any you know, side. Usually, the China is side with uh, North Korea. And this is one of the signs that uh, currently North Korea and China's relationship is a little bit of a weird. And of course, and uh, at the final point, the ASEAN foreign ministers released a joint community, uh, communique, and then they condemned the North Korean missile test, but at the same time, they are calling for the cooperation to reduce the peninsula tensions. Dr. Nielsen Wright, Defense Minister Shin, as I mentioned at the top, has hinted at the possibility of North Korea conducting its seventh mm -hmm. nuclear test around the U.S. presidential election. What's your take on this? But um, because we are running a bit short on time, if you could mention a bit more briefly. Yes, of course. Um, yes, the North Koreans are worried about enhanced deterrence cooperation between the U.S. and South Korea, the U.S. and Japan. Um, and they may be emboldened, of course, by the reality of that closer Russia-North Korea defense strategic um, agreement, which is unprecedented. Um, but I think for, for the most part, we need to sort of see this in the round. And as President Park was explaining, there's a gap between the rhetorical threats emanating from the North and actually its willingness to engage in real provocations. Uh, for Kim Jong-un, the leader of North Korea, there are concerns about his poor health. South Korean sources have suggested that he may be increasingly overweight, suffering from high blood pressure. There are worries about the economic impact of flooding in the north of the country. Um, it may therefore be that Kim feels that a distraction that a seventh nuclear test would represent might um, reassure public opinion at home at a time of difficulties on the home front. Um, but given all of that, um, the countervailing forces are the closer relationship between Russia and China, uh, which I think will allow Kim to focus on more material objectives in terms of his conventional forces, satellite launch capabilities. Um, and he can take some comfort from the fact that the economy of North Korea has been doing reasonably well, growing about 3% um, over the course of the last year. Um, looking ahead to November, it's a waiting game. Kim, I think, will want to see um, whether Trump really is going to be able to double down on his uh, small lead on the opinion polls. 
Uh, and therefore, I don't think he's going to want to do anything at this stage that might destabilize the prospects for a Trump victory. So for now, I think while we should remain vigilant, a seventh nuclear test is probably not on the cards in the immediate future. And before we let you go, Professor Park, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un is preparing his teenage daughter, Chue, to lead the state after his death, according to Seoul's intelligence agency. It did, however, leave the door open for possible changes. What are your thoughts? And I yes, National Intelligence Service uh, gives some kind of two reasons that they are considered Chue's possible successor of the Kim Jong-un first. They said that North Korean state media referred to Chue as a great person of guidance in Korean Hyangdo. This is the only word that can be used for the successor. And second one is that lately Chue is uh, accompanied with uh, his father Kim Jong Un, and 70% of the so called uh, site visit is about the military side because Chue is a young daughter and young girl, and she has lack of the military experience. That's why his father Kim Jong Un has brought her to this military side, and there's two reasons. But still, I'm quite, uh, you know, a little bit doubt about the, whether she's going to be a full successor of the Kim Jong Un because. And North Korea still is a, such a male dominant society and not ready to have uh, the female leader. And second, back to mountain blood, I'm talking about Kim's family. And if she is married, and then if she has a daughter and sons, and especially sons, and following the uh, father's the last name is no longer Kim's family. And that's another serious problem. The most serious thing is that North Korea is such a one person rule the country. They are not allowed the second position. So still, I'm a little bit doubt about the uh, the successor, Chu as a successor. All right, we'll leave it there tonight. Thank you so much, Professor Park and Dr. Nielsen Wright for your perspectives. Pleasure. Thank you. And that brings us to the end of the show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.